peace to you. My name is Pastor Doug, and I am the pastor at Portage United Methodist Church in Portage, Wisconsin. It is my privilege to welcome you to this worship video for Sunday, January 24th, 2021. As we celebrate together, I would invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, to like our Facebook page, comment below these videos, let us know that you were watching, share any thoughts, questions, ideas that you might have, and then post these to your own social media so that you can share them and we can continue to grow our online ministry together. Music centers us as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. join me in the call to worship, the words will appear on your screen. In the midst of everyday living, God is calling. We listen with curiosity and wonder in our hearts. Christ calls us to follow him, to become fishers for people. We answer with boldness, serving one another in love. Please join me for hymn 577, God of Grace and God of Glory. Thank you. 
The words will appear on your screen. Creator God, you made all things, giving them purpose and meaning. Nothing exists apart from you. You formed us in your divine image, showered us with your love, and call us in every moment to be part of your work. And yet, we often hesitate to respond. We are uncomfortable leaving the familiar behind and not always willing to let go of what we know. We hold for ourselves what you have given us to share with others, and we are afraid to risk being vulnerable. Forgive us, O God, pour out your mercy and grace upon us. Give us courage to step out in faith, reach to those around us in love. Fill us with your spirit that we may live and grow as true disciples, ready to follow where you lead. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The reading is from Mark 1, 14 through 20. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land possessions lie. I'm bound for the promised land. I'm proud for the promised land. For who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. The generous fruits that never fail on trees immortal grow. There's rocks and hills and brooks and vales with milk and honey flow. I'm bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Well, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. For all those wide extended plains shines one eternal day. 
God on high forever reigns and scatters night away. I'm bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. When shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? When shall I see my father's face and in his bosom rest? I'm bound for the promised land. I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. Bound for the promised land, I'm bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Fishing. Many of you are probably familiar with it, whether you yourself have been or you know somebody who has. One can hardly cast a line around here and not hook someone with an interest in fishing. Along with hunting and going up north, fishing is one of those things that immediately conjures up certain images, even for those who don't spend a lot of time outdoors. Folks who go fishing are passionate about it, and they are dedicated. Many are willing to spend thousands of dollars on boats, poles, lures, licenses, and all sorts of other equipment. They carve time out of their busy schedules. They hang out with their fishing buddies, and they make the space to get away. There's even an entire aesthetic around having gone fishing, complete with all sorts of signs and knickknacks that has taken over part of our collective culture, especially here in Wisconsin. Growing up, I knew a lot of people who liked to fish, friends, family, neighbors. Some of the kids on my street would spend a whole lot of time down by the culvert when the weather was good. The water there was usually running, except for when it was really dry. It was shallow, not always fast moving, but it was good for catching crayfish, or at least so the other kids told me. I would often go down there with them, watching from the bank as they stood in the cold water and dug around for the elusive creatures. When I got older and I was on staff at camp, one of the groups that I worked with on the waterfront was our fishing camp. I remember that it was always full, to the point that some people ended up on a waiting list every year. They knew that they were there for one purpose. Sure, they'd go along with whatever we were doing for camp stuff if we made them do it, but fishing time is what they were really most looking forward to. If given the choice, I think they would have spent all day and all night, every day, just fishing. Now, I don't have that sort of passion for fishing. Yes, I've watched others do it, and I've even tried it a few times myself, but it just doesn't seem to be my thing. When I was a kid, I had a hard time getting the worms to stay on the hook. I didn't like having to skewer them as I put them on, and I was also afraid that I would accidentally jab the hook into my finger, something that I knew from my scout training wasn't going to be a pleasant experience. After several tries, my parents eventually had me use hot dogs instead, and that was a little easier. But then the fish started biting. Now, I'll admit, catching them was actually sort of fun. It was getting them off the hook and letting them go that I struggled with. I didn't want to touch the fish because they were slimy and they flopped all over the place, and you always had to watch out for the spines in their fins. I couldn't just cut the line, though, because that would have left them with a hook in their mouths. So no matter what I tried, they didn't seem to want to hold still long enough for me to get it out. Like I said, fishing just doesn't seem to be my thing. But the same isn't true for the men that Jesus encountered in this passage from the Gospel of Mark. You see, when it came to fishing... 
and catching fish, they were experts. They would have spent years learning how to fish from others, serving as apprentices, helping in their father's boats. They practiced their trade every day, and then they went over every piece of equipment when they got back, mending and repairing it as needed, so that they would be ready to do it all over again. Day after day, they would get into their boats, put out from the shore, cast their nets, and haul in their catch. To a certain extent, they must have enjoyed the work and the routine. But this wasn't just a hobby or something that they did on the weekends. This was their livelihood. They did it because they had to, in order to provide for themselves and their families. A bad catch one day might have meant going without for a little while, especially since the Romans collected their tax regardless of how the fish were doing. Several bad catches over many days would have been much, much worse. In addition to being good at catching fish and maintaining their own equipment, these men would also have had to have been good salesmen. It wasn't all that unusual, especially at that time, for fishermen to sell right out of their boats, and for those buying to walk along the shoreline in search of the best deal. They would have been interacting with a lot of people, both the passing strangers as well as their regular customers. But for the most part, these folks would have been coming to them. They wouldn't have had to have gone searching for them. Enter Jesus. At first glance, this was a man no different than the many others who frequented that stretch of shoreline. He may have walked straight through, not really bothering to stop for anything, or he may have wandered from boat to boat, striking up conversation, listening as different people shared their stories. When he eventually came to Simon and his brother Andrew, Jesus did not ask to buy any fish. Instead, he said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. This was certainly unexpected. I don't know, maybe they were used to hearing strange things from people, but this seems stranger than most. To be asked to walk away, to leave everything behind, to give up the thing that they had dedicated their lives to that kept them and their families alive must have sounded absolutely crazy. It went against what they knew, what they expected, what any of them were comfortable with. After all, there is a big difference between greeting a neighbor or haggling with someone over price and whatever this man Jesus was asking of them. Like these fishermen, we've gotten used to things operating a certain way, both in nature and in our society. Pretty much everyone expects that when we throw an object into the air, it will always fall back to the ground. After all, that is the law of gravity. We trust that our society will be orderly and will, for the most part, adhere to the rules that we all agree upon. That is part of the social contract of government. We expect that when we work for something, at our job or in any other part of our lives, we will be rewarded with the fruits of our labor because that is what gives us the incentive to keep going. Unfortunately, life does not always go according to plan. Nature can sometimes behave in strange and unusual ways that we don't fully understand. People who seem perfectly healthy can suddenly be fighting for their lives because of an unexpected illness or injury. And ordinary people, beloved children of God, can find themselves the victims of bullying, abuse, and violence through no fault of their own. Being forced out of our comfort zone like this is scary. We lose the ability to rely on what's familiar and what we're used to, or at least it seems like we do. Our experience, our training, our expertise all fail us. Our efforts, no matter how bold and valiant, don't produce the results that they should. We end up feeling as if we've been tossed into the deep end without a life preserver. And that can be a very dangerous place especially if it catches us unaware. As a lifeguard, I learned all sorts of techniques and approaches to help rescue people in the water. I was taught how to hold people stable in case they might have a head, neck, or back injury, how to apply first aid, how to do CPR, or use the AED. 
but the thing that still stands out to me the most is how often they told us that rescuers are seriously injured or killed by the people they're trying to save. We've all seen those folks on television or in the movies who flail around, convinced that they're drowning and that they're going to die, only to stand up and find that the water barely reaches their knees. It seems silly to us, almost stupid in a way, but the reason that it happens is because someone who is actively drowning or who believes that they are drowning can no longer think clearly. They are in survival mode, pushed beyond the point of being able to reasonably understand their situation or to think rationally about how to get out of it. All they want to do is to return to normalcy, to be out of the water so that they can breathe again. And they will push their rescuers under to do it. So it's no wonder that many of us are hesitant to step out of our comfort zone, to risk going to those places where things don't always play out the way we expect they will. We prefer the familiarity of what we know, the relative safety of the rhythms and the patterns that we can predict. And on top of that, we are afraid to lose what we have. We don't want to let people down. We don't want to see the things that we have worked so hard for disappear. We don't want to be overwhelmed or to have to wonder whether we'll have enough to make it through another day. We don't want to feel as if we are drowning. Scripture tells us that the first disciples responded to Jesus' call that day by choosing to follow. It makes sense to us now, given what we know about who Jesus was and the life that he was calling them to, but in the context of the moment, it must have seemed rather strange. Even if they thought it was only going to be for the rest of the day or for a couple of days, they were still giving up a lot to satisfy their curiosity about this man. And if it was something more, if they were able to sense something more about who was inviting them into this relationship, they were still taking a leap of faith. It is worth noting that none of them seem to have taken a whole lot of time to think about it. The author of Mark described their response to Jesus as immediate, and immediately they left their nets and followed him. No waiting around, no cleaning up things, no saying goodbye to their loved ones first. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. These were no small acts of faith. It takes a great deal of courage to step out of one's comfort zone like they did, especially when so much of the journey was still unknown. All they had was Jesus' word and the promise that he would make them fish for people. And yet all four of these men, Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were at least willing to give it a try. They were willing to trust that something greater was at work. But starting strong like this didn't necessarily guarantee they would follow through in the end. And as we look at the stories of the disciples recorded by the gospel writers, we see that choosing to follow wasn't a one-time thing. Jesus was constantly having to call attention to where they were wandering, to invite them back in and to remind them of the greater purpose. And for their part, the disciples were constantly having to choose over and over and over again to follow, even though it often seemed strange or counterintuitive to do so. There are many examples of this. One of the more famous ones appears in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus called Peter to him in the middle of the storm. Once again, Peter had to choose to leave the comfort and relative safety of what was familiar, in other words, the boat in the middle of the lake. He had to respond to God's call by literally stepping out in faith and onto the surface of the water. After Jesus had died and been raised, the disciples went back to their boats, and Jesus had to call them again. 
He appeared to them on the shoreline, shared a meal with them, and invited them once more to be part of the ongoing ministry that he had started with them. Like the disciples, each of us are called by Christ to follow. Many of us have chosen at least once to answer that call in some way, shape, or form. At our baptism, the commitment was made for us by our parents, our sponsors, and our faith communities. If we were confirmed in the church, or if we have taken the vows of membership, then we have made that choice and that commitment for ourselves. If all we have done is shown up and participated in the ministries of the church, or if we have found ways to live out God's love in our own lives, then we also have chosen to follow. These are no small acts of faith. Stepping out of our comfort zone, taking on new responsibilities, beginning new seasons of our journey when we don't necessarily know where we'll end up can be scary. And yet perhaps now more than ever, that is exactly what we are being called to do. As people of faith, as the body of Christ in the world, we have an opportunity and a responsibility to model a better way of being to show people what it means to be beloved community together. Choosing to follow Christ isn't a one-time thing. Rather, we must commit ourselves to it over and over and over again every time we hear God's call. Every time Christ invites us to journey with him, we must choose once again to follow the path of discipleship. We must choose to trust, even though It might seem strange or counterintuitive. May it be so according to God's will. Amen. Hey everybody, it's Nikki Briggs, PUMC Youth Director. I just wanted to let you know that uh, beginning Wednesday, January 27th, we're going to be starting a new youth study called Soul Searching. Um, I'm going to be posting a new video every Wednesday at 6.30, and you can watch it between Wednesday and Sunday when it's convenient for you. And then starting uh, January 31st, Sunday evening from 6 to 7, I'll be opening up a link um, where we can chat about the video or just catch up. And so if you have any questions, you can give me a call at 608-697-3993, and I hope to see you there. God's call continues in our lives today, inviting us to be part of the work that God is doing in our world by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Even though our building may be closed, the mission and ministry of our congregation continues thanks to your support, financially or otherwise. As you consider how you might continue your giving with our congregation, we invite you to think about mailing your offering to the church office or dropping it off in the secure drop box outside the front door. To call the church and we can help you set up an electronic funds transfer to automatically deposit your offering at a time and amount of your choosing. Visit our website and give using the secure donation portal there or to give via text using the information found on your screen. If you are a member of another faith community worshiping with us, we invite you to give your financial gifts there so that you can continue to support the ministry that is happening in your area and respond to God's call in your midst. In addition to our offerings, God also calls us to lift up our prayers, our joys, our celebrations, our concerns, and our struggles, to pray for one another and for the world as we share in God's work. Therefore, let us come before the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. For the beauty of your creation and all that is around us, giving praise and wonder to you. We see your presence in our midst through all the many signs of life that fill our days. And we thank you especially for Jesus, who lived and walked among us, who called us to your service and showed us what it meant to serve you with our whole being. Because of him, we know that you understand what it's like to live our lives, 
to experience all of the joy and the struggle, to know what it is to be fully human. And we trust that as we lift our prayers to you, spoken and otherwise, you hold them close to your own heart. God, we lift before you all those who continue to struggle with this pandemic, for those who are facing the illness itself, for those who are responsible for giving care to others, the medical professionals, and all those distributing vaccines, for our frontline workers, for teachers and others who are putting themselves at risk to provide care and instruction and resources to those who need them. We pray also for those who are struggling with loneliness and isolation as we continue our practices of social distancing. Help them to feel connected by your spirit and give us the courage to reach out to one another, whether on the phone or in other ways. God, we pray for those who are struggling with natural disasters in their midst, for those whose communities are racked by climate change. We pray also for those living in places of violence and fear, for where conflict is dividing communities and causing harm to those already vulnerable. God, we pray for your people around the world for the joys and milestones that they are able to celebrate, for new possibilities and new opportunities. We pray especially for the people of our nation as we transition to new leadership, both in our legislature and in our presidency. We ask that you would guide these elected officials, that you would give them wisdom and grace, and that together with them, we might all work toward your vision for our world, one of your peace, your justice, your love. Holy God, hear our prayers. Give us what we need so that we might hear your call in our lives and respond with boldness and faith, sharing in your work in the world, living as your disciples. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit, as we pray together the prayer Jesus taught us, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil, for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is, Lord, You Have Come to the Lakeshore. The words appear on your screen.
friends, as we go from this digital space, know that we do not go alone, but with the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the community of the Holy Spirit, to love and to serve God and neighbor in all that we do, now and forevermore. Go in peace. Amen.